Hello there, welcome to Fundamentals of Biology, lesson 14, where we're going to be having a look at animal tissues. So we're taking a step up in size and complexity from what we've been looking at so far, uh, where we've been focused on biological molecules and also cells. So now we're going to start putting cells together to make animal tissues. So let's go through and have a look at what we're going to cover today. So by the end of this session, you should be able to describe the organization of animal bodies. You should be able to list the four main tissue types that make up animal bodies and briefly outline the structure and function of those four main types of tissue. And as you can see here, they are epithelial, connective, muscular and nervous tissues. So those are the four main tissue types and later on this session we're going to start looking at those in a bit more detail and we'll talk about their structures and functions. So before we dive into that it's worth getting a, a little bit of a grasp on some of the terminology that we use when we're discussing animals and a couple of terms that you'll probably be familiar with are anatomy and physiology and it's quite easy to, to get a bit confused over which one is which so let's let's have a look at these quickly. When we were looking at some of the biological molecules, particularly things like proteins and um, specific proteins, so enzymes, for instance, I talked a lot about the fact that structure equals function. And we see similar things when we, when we move into a, a larger context. So when we're talking about anatomy, we're talking about the, the structure, so the biological form of an organism. So that is the actual structure of part of the organism. So you could take your hand, for instance. The anatomy of your hand would be the, the bones that make up the, the skeletal system inside the hand. The, it'll be the tendons and the ligaments and the muscles and the, the nerves. All of those things that actually go into physically making the structure of the hand. And then we can look at the physiology of the hand. So the physiology is the biological functions that the organism can perform. So again, if we look at the hand, the anatomy is what enables the physiology. So the, the structure of the hand enables it to grasp objects. It enables us to manipulate objects. We can pick things up. We can use tools. We can do really sort of fine, mo fine motions and fine, fine movements. But then we can also do sort of bigger work, if you like. So picking up heavy objects and gripping things quite hard. And all of that comes down to the anatomy. So again, structure equals function. Anatomy is the structure. Physiology is the function. And as you can see there, the comparative study of animals reveals that form and function or structure and function are closely correlated. And we see this all through biology, like I said before, from when we're looking at really small things like biological molecules, such as proteins, right the way up to when we're looking at actual animals and uh, parts of the animals that are able to do specific jobs. Okay, so that's the difference between anatomy and physiology then. So it's structure and function again. And when we start looking at the overall anatomy of the animal, so the overall structure of the animal, what we see is that the size and shape that affect the way an animal interacts with its environment is determined by the genome. Well, we know this. We, we've talked about DNA um, and RNA, so the nucleic acids, and how DNA codes for the production of proteins. RNA builds those proteins. And it's those proteins that largely lead to the structure of that animal. And then, as we just discussed, the structure is the anatomy, and that leads to the physiology, the, the function of that animal. And this has been honed over millions of years of evolution. So animals have evolved to, to survive in different habitats under different environmental pressures. So we obviously see a few very, very different types of animal there. So we've got an elephant and we've got a boxfish and we've got an albatross there. Three animals that have evolved to live in very, very different habitats. So they have the environment putting very very different pressures on them so they have evolved very different structures to carry out very different functions and we're going to investigate some of these more in the coming sessions so how different animals survive in different habitats 
So we also see that physical laws govern the strength of an animal, so that it, and I can include the size of the animal with that as well, uh, but also on a, on, on a smaller level, so that how things diffuse in and out of the animal. So we're talking about things like carbon dioxide and oxygen. We can also talk about movement, so how an animal actually moves within its environment. And we can also talk about things like heat exchange, and I've got a session on heat exchange. Uh, it's a process called thermoregulation. So we'll investigate that in more detail um, in the future. But it's a really, really important component of all animals' lives is trying to maintain an optimal internal temperature. And you know why that is, because we've already studied proteins um, and enzymes specifically. So we know that the, the impact that temperature can have on those biological molecules. So it's important that an animal is able to regulate its internal temperature. And these are physical laws. So they sort of govern the way that an animal is evolved um, and it will, it will determine its shape and size determined on the, um, the, the environment that it lives in. So as an example here, we can use water. So properties of water, so water is more viscous than air. So it's, it's more dense than air. It's harder to move through than air. Um, so the properties of water will limit the possible shapes for fast swimming animals. So if you want to live in water and you need to move through that water quickly, what we see is you have to have a specific body shape. And because of that, we see something called convergent evolution in a lot of aquatic animals. So convergent evolution, if you've not heard of it before, is where we see the similar adaptations in diverse organisms because they face the same environmental challenges. So in this case, if we look at the, the, the photos on the right hand side here, we have a seal, which is obviously a mammal. We have a penguin, which is a bird. And then we have this tuna, which is a fish. So very distantly related animals. So these are very different animals, yet you can see how they have evolved to have the same basic body shape and this is a body shape that we call fusiform and that basically means that it's tapered at both ends and it gets thicker in the middle so you start off narrow at the front you get wider in the middle and then you taper off again towards the rear and this fusiform or streamlined body shape is the most hydrodynamic shape that you can have so this will enable those animals to move through the water more quickly that means it requires less energy because there is less drag on them. The, the water around them is constantly sort of grabbing at them. It, it produces a lot of friction that the animals have to overcome. So they've evolved this similar body shape. So that is an example of convergent evolution. You can also look at convergent evolution with the, um, the, with the evolution of wings in birds and bats. So you've got very different um, animals but they have evolved these similar structures to overcome similar pressures. So they need to fly and flight requires certain things. So lightweight, it requires wings. Um, and so we can see that convergent evolution in them. What we also see with animals is there are certain things that correlate. So if an animal wants to increase in size, so if you want to look at something like an elephant or a rhino, well, as they get bigger, they will need thicker skeletons to support that additional mass, that additional weight. So certain things will, will correlate. So as your size increases, well, so does your skeletal system, so does your circulatory system. So you'll need to pump blood around that increased body mass. So this might seem um, sort of fairly obvious, but it is an important thing to remember when we're looking at the, the structures of animals. And like I said, we're gonna investigate some of these things in more detail as we go through the coming sessions. When we look at an animal's body, so regardless of, of what animal it is, whether you're looking at something like a, a, a small elephant shrew or you're looking at a, a massive African elephant itself, it's very easy to forget what we're actually looking at. So we looked at a few sessions ago, cells, so basic eukaryotic cells that, that make up animals, plants, fungi and protists. And it's easy to forget when we look at a large animal or, or any animal that it is still just made up of cells. So in the case of a typical adult human, 
somewhere around the region of 70 to 100 trillion individual cells. So it's important to remember the, the, the basic building blocks of an animal is it's still individual cells. But when we looked at our cells, we, we talked about them, or the examples that I gave you were quite generic. But what we actually see when we, we investigate animals in more detail is that most animals are actually composed of highly specialized cells. So those highly specialized cells will have specific structures um, and particular specific functions. And we're going to investigate some of those starting today and, and in the coming sessions. So most animals are composed of these specialized cells and they will organize themselves into tissues. And those tissues have different functions. So if you remember how these individual cells will sort of come together and, and join together, remember we, we looked at the plasma membranes of cells and we saw those um, cell recognition tags and the sites of attachment, so the glycoproteins and the glycolipids. Well, this is how those cells come together to form tissues. And those tissues will have specialized functions. Those tissues will come together to make up organs. So organs will be things like the heart and the lungs and the kidneys and the liver and the brain. So we've got those organs that are made up of tissues and those tissues are made up of cells. And then we also find that our organs will work with other organs to make organ systems. So I've got some examples at the bottom there and, and I'll, I'll go through a more com a comprehensive list of our organ systems in a sec. But we can see some examples here. So the lymphatic system, the respiratory system, digestive, urinary um, and reproductive system. So these are all examples of some of our organ systems. And it's important to remember that we are still made of cells. So cells come together to form tissues. Tissues come together to form organs. And then organs will work together within organ systems. So here we can see the 11 organ systems found in mammals. So let's go through these and I'll give you a little bit of detail about them. So we have the digestive system. This is quite a useful table actually because it shows you the anatomy and physiology. So you've got the structure and then you've got the function over here. So our digestive system, well we start off at the mouth and then we move down into the, the throat region in the pharynx the esophagus down into the stomach, moving into the intestines. And then we also incorporate the liver and the pancreas. And then obviously we have the anus for um, egestion, so the removal of undigested food. So what's going on? What, is, what are the main functions of the digestive system? Well, we've got food processing basically, haven't we? So we ingest food, we take food in at the mouth, we digest food, so we break it down and then we absorb that food into our bloodstream so it can go into our cells. And then anything that is um, a waste product, so it's undigested food, sort of damaged blood cells, things like that, um, and certain bacteria, we will eliminate. So we can, that's a process called egestion. Okay, so that's the di uh, basics of the digestive system. Next, we've got the circulatory system, which is made up of the heart, blood vessels, and the blood itself. And that is used for internal distribution of materials. So what kind of things are we talking about here? Well, pretty much everything. So the most obvious ones are things like oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we breathe in oxygen or breathe in air through, uh, through our mouth and nose and it goes into our lungs. And the oxygen then from our lungs has to get transported to every part of our body. Well, how does it do that? It does it through the blood. Um, and you, you also have nutrients going through the blood. Um, we also, um, the immune system will rely on the, the transport of the blood as well. So the blood is basically the, the well, you often hear the term, the lifeblood of a system. You know, it's the blood that is delivering everything to every part of the body. So it's, it's absolutely essential. Next, we've got the respiratory system, which I just mentioned. So we, uh, and again, I've got a session on this that we'll look at in the future. Um, but we've got the lungs, the trachea, and other breathing tubes like the bronchi and the bronchioles, um, and then the alveoli as well, which are part of the lungs. So we'll investigate all of those. 
So what are we talking about here in terms of the function? We're, we're talking about gas exchange. So our, our bodies use up vast quantities of oxygen and you know why we use oxygen now because we've looked at the process of cellular respiration. So we know that we need oxygen to generate ATP energy to, to carry out cellular work. And then we also know because we, we've looked at, again, cellular respiration. So most notably the link reaction in the Krebs cycle where we're generating carbon dioxide as a waste product. Well, we need to get rid of that carbon dioxide and we do that through our lungs as well. So the respiratory system is used for gas exchange, bringing in oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide. We then have the immune system, which incorporates the, the lymphatic system. So this is quite a, a complex system that incorporates um, lots of different things. So we've got the bone marrow for the making of um, blood cells. We have our lymph nodes, the thymus, the spleen, and the lymph vessels and lymph nodes that are around the lymphatic system. And these all together work to keep us healthy. So they make up our immune system. So they're, they're there for body defense. So fighting infections. So this might be bacterial infection or a viral infection. Um, obviously, the, the viral infection is a, is a big thing at the moment with uh, COVID-19. Um, so our immune system is working really hard to, to protect us from bacteria and viruses, but also things like virally induced cancers and, and lots of other things that anything that's basically going to try and infect us with something, our immune system is there to protect us. Next, we have the excretory system. And it's important to note at this point that when I'm talking about excretion, if we go over here, we can see that it's made up of the, the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder and the urethra. The excretory system is specifically there for the, the disposal of metabolic waste. So by this, we are talking about nitrogenous waste. So when we digest carbohydrates and lipids, for instance, when we have surplus of those, we can convert them into fat and we can store them for later use. But the proteins and the nucleic acids, that so DNA and RNA, those things that we consume, we cannot store them. So they have to get, be gotten rid of. So we actually turn that into a product called urea, which you might be familiar with. And urea is the one of the main components of our urine. So our excretory system is there really to, to get rid of or dispose of this metabolic nitrogenous waste. And it helps us to maintain the osmotic balance of our blood. So that is the make sure that our blood has the right water and solute concentration. And again, I've got a session on this, so we'll talk about that. The important bit here is to not get mixed up with excretion and ingestion. So you remember that the, the, the removal of feces, so the, um, the excretion of feces is actually called ingestion. It's the removal of undigested food. Um, and, but we often refer to that as excretion, but it's not. It's not, specific, it's not properly called excretion. It's called ingestion. Excretion is the removal of nitrogenous waste. So in our case, it's urea. But as we'll look at in the future, different animals will do it in slightly different ways. So fish will excrete ammonia. Uh, birds will excrete uric acid. So there's different ways of, of getting rid of our nitrogenous waste as animals. Next, we have the endocrine system. Uh, so hormones, essentially. And again, we've got a lot of hormone glands throughout our body. So some here, the pituitary, the thyroid, the pancreas, adrenal. Um, so that, uh, again, I've got a session on this. So we'll look at this in more detail. And this is an incredibly important system for coordinating longer lasting body activity. So things like growth and our metabolism. So digestion um, and other aspects of metabolism, but also reproduction and sexual development mood, our circadian rhythms, all of these things are controlled by the endocrine system. So it's an incredibly important system. Next, we have the reproductive system. So the ovaries and the testes and associated organs that, that go along with those. So the uterus and the vagina and the penis and um, all of those kinds of things. And what does the reproductive system do? Well, I think we're all aware of that. We've, we've talked about meiosis before. So we know that it's responsible for the production of gametes, so ova and sperm. 
And also in female mammals, you've obviously got the support of the developing embryo. So the development of a placenta and an umbilical cord and the, the provision of nutrients and the removal of waste. So again, it's, a, it's quite a complex process. Um, so that's the reproductive system. We also have the nervous system. So brain, spinal cord, nerves, sensory organs. And I do a session on this as well that we'll talk about. And this is, my, uh, so unlike the endocrine system, the nervous system is much more for fast reactions. So almost immediate reactions. You're taking in information or so sensory stimuli from the world around you or also inside of you. And then you are able to respond to that quite quickly. Okay, so the nervous system is there for coordination of body activities. So you're constantly sensing the, the, the environment inside of you so you can make subtle changes to maintain and regulate blood glucose levels, body temperature, those kinds of things. But we're also detecting external stimuli and formulating responses to them. So you see a lion running towards you, your response will be to run away or hide or curl up into a ball or something like that. Next one, integumentary system. So this one you might not be fam um, so familiar with, or that name anyway, you'll be familiar with the, the components. So the integumentary system is skin and skin derivatives. So we have skin itself, but we also have things like hair, claws, um, and sweat glands. So these are the, the main functions then are for protection against mechanical injury, uh, protection from infection. So obviously we don't want to be open to the external world because you'll be getting infected with bacteria and fungi, things like that. Uh, but it also helps to prevent desiccation. So it helps to prevent dehydration. It keeps our water inside. And it also helps us to regulate and maintain our body temperature. So it, this process of thermoregulation. Next one is our skeletal system. This one's a fairly straightforward one. So it's made up of our skeletons. So our bones, tendons, ligaments, and cartilage are incorporated into that. And this is for body support. Um, so obviously it enables us to, to stand upright and um, protect our internal organs. So you've obviously got our, your rib cage, which helps to protect our, our vital organs. So our lungs and our heart, um, as well as helping to, to power the lungs in, in ventilation. But we also need our skeletons for movement. So our muscular system works closely with our skeletal system to basically enable our movement. So muscles work on our um, skeletons, on our bones that enable movement. The muscular system also incorporates other aspects. So the heart is muscle, for instance, the, the linings of our intestines and our stomach aligned with muscles that are um, and the muscles are required for their healthy functioning so muscle isn't all about moving um, but where it is so our skeletal muscles work alongside our skeletons to enable us to move so those are the the 11 organ systems in mammals and like i said a lot of these we will go on to investigate um, in in later sessions as we've established now then structure equals function so we see that with biological molecules, we see it with cells, and then we also see it with our tissues. So different tissues have different structures that are suited to their functions. And as we've seen already, tissues are classified into four main categories. So we've got four main classes of animal tissue. We have epithelial, we have connective, we have muscle, and then we have nervous. So what we're going to do now is go through each one of these and talk a little bit about the structure and function of each one of these four types of tissue. So epithelial tissue covers the outside of the body and it also lines the organs and cavities within the body. So epithelial tissue is when you look at your, your arm, it's, it's the skin, but it also makes up the lining of your mouth and of your nose. Uh, but also, obviously, you can't see inside yourself, but what we also see is that it lines the organs. So it's epithelial tissue that makes up the lining of our stomach and of our intestines, for instance. And because it has such a, a wide range of functions, um, it has to have a wide range of different structures. So not all epithelial tissue is made the same. Typically, though, it is 
made up of cells that are closely joined together. And if you think about it, that makes sense, doesn't it? So the cells that make up our skin, for instance, you don't want them sort of loosely spaced together because we'd leak everywhere um, and we would lose a lot of water through evaporation and you'd be open to, to bacterial and fungal infections. Um, so it's important with epithelial tissue that the cells are very, very tightly joined. And we find that the, the shape of epithelial cells differs. So again, structure equals function. So the, the structure of our cells that make up our epithelial tissue are specific to their jobs. And we'll, we'll look at some of these over the coming slides. But our main shapes of, or main structures of our epithelial tissue cells, well, they can be cuboidal. So they can be like dice. So you can see here in the top left hand di of this diagram. So cuboidal is, as you'd imagine, they're cube shaped. Um, and these are particularly good for absorption and secretion. We see columnar, so they basically make up columns. So like bricks on end, so you can see them down here on the bottom left, they make up these columns. And columnar cells are also good for secretion and absorption, but they also provide protection. I will give you examples of where we find these in a moment, but you can maybe start thinking about where we might find some of these cells. And then we have squamous, which are very thin cells. So they're a bit like floor tiles. Um, so you can see up here on the top right, forget about the bottom right, I'm gonna cover that on the next slide. But you can see the simple squamous here or squamous cells are very, very thin. So those are our main cell shapes. And then we can arrange them in slightly different ways as well. So we can arrange them in a single layer and when we do that, we refer to it as simple epithelial or um, simple epithelial tissue. So you can see here a single layer of squamous cells. So this would be simple squamous. Here we can see a single layer of cuboidal cells. So this would be simple cuboidal tissue. And here we can see simple columnar. So a single layer of columnar cells. So we would refer to this as simple columnar epithelial tissue. But we can also layer our um, epithelial cells. So down here, we can see multiple layers of squamous cells. And when we do that, we call it stratified. So this would be stratified squamous epithelium, stratified cuboidal. And then we tend not to find stratified columnar, but instead we get this odd one here, which is called pseudo stratified columnar epithelial tissue. There's a bit of a mouthful, that one. If you look closely at the, the structure of these cells, you can see that they're just individual cells next to each other, but because the nuclei are in different places, they sort of alternate and they're in sort of odd arrangements here, it actually looks like when you're looking at this particular type of tissue under a microscope, it actually at first glance looks like it's stratified, but on closer inspection, it's not. It's a simple layer. It's just individual columnar cells, but because it has the appearance of being stratified, we would say that it's pseudo stratified. When, when you see this prefix of pseudo, it generally means something that is pretending to be or something that is but isn't really. So you'll often see on people referring to sort of dodgy websites that cover um, conspiracy theories as being pseudo scientific. So they're pretending to be scientific, but there isn't actually any science behind them. Okay, so that's our main type. So we can get a simple, which is a single layer of cells, or we can be stratified. So we get multiple layers, or in this case, we can have pseudo stratified. So next I'll show you a diagram and we'll have a look at where we find some of these. So hopefully you've been giving this a bit of thought as we've gone over the, the last couple of slides. But here we can see um, a diagram. So we can see a wolf here. Um, and then if we look at the top left hand side here, we can see a simple cuboidal arrangement. And as I said, cuboidal cells are particularly good for secretion and absorption. So we tend to find cuboidal cells in places like the kidneys and the salivary glands. Next, we can see a simple columnar epithelium arrangement, and that is in the intestines. So if you think about what the intestines do, 
They are important for secretion. So they have to secrete mucus to enable food to, to keep moving through the intestines. But they are also need they also need to be able to absorb the nutrients that have been released from our food. So our food is digested, it's broken down, and then we need to absorb it. But you also need to protect them. It's very important that our intestines don't get damaged because you'll end up with um, all kinds of bacteria getting into your bloodstream, uh, which would would be really really bad and would end up in in serious ill health. So our our, our intestines need to have this combination of being able to secrete, absorb, but also protect. So that really that, that, that's a really important type of cell there. Up here, we've got that strange one that I mentioned, a uh, bit of a mouthful, but it's the pseudostratified columnar epithelium. But in this case, it's also ciliated. So that just means that it has these little hair-like projections that poke out of the, the um, one end. So cilia, we, we talked briefly about when we looked at cell structure, they're made up of part of the cytoskeleton. They are like little hair projections. So you can see it down here. They, they are in the respiratory tract. So what these cells actually do, they will secrete a mucus. So here we can see the respiratory tract here, the, um, the trachea leading down into the bronchi, into the lungs. Well, those cells will secrete a mucus and that mucus will trap any dust or dirt or bacteria or virus particles or pollen, all of the things that we're breathing in on a, a daily basis, they will get trapped in the mucus and then those cilia will waft upwards and they will move that mucus back up into our pharynx, back up into our throat, where we can either swallow it, where it will get broken down in our stomach or we can spit it out. That, that's where we get this combination of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So interestingly, um, smoking, so smokers, you'll often be familiar with um, having a smoker's cough. And a lot of this is to do with the fact that smoking will really clog up those, um, those cilia that line the, the airways. That means that the mucus is no longer free flowing and the cilia are no longer able to waft it upwards. So that really sort of deep, horrible smoker's cough that you get um, is there to basically, you're trying to dislodge that mucus so you can bring it back up into the pharynx to keep the airways clear. Um, and smoking can also damage the cilia as well, so you're not producing them as much of them. Uh, so yeah, smoking's not a good idea. Next one down then, we have the stratified squamous epithelium. And this is really, really important for any part of the body that experiences friction. So you can imagine, so you can see it here, that it makes up our skin, um, but also the mouth. But you'll also find this in the nose um, and also in the anus and also the penis and the vagina. So anywhere in the, in the body that will um, experience friction, it's important that you have this stratified arrangement of cells so that the friction, if it or when it moves or removes the upper layers of these cells, it's not exposing the underlying tissue. So you can slough off a couple of these upper layers of cells through friction, and then you've still got more underneath, and then you can just sort of replace them over time. So stratified squamous epithelia, really important for areas of friction. And then we've got another type of squamous. We've got this simple squamous epithelium. So this is incredibly thin, and this is important for anywhere in the body that you need to um, you need diffusion of substances. Our blood vessels and our lungs, so the alveoli of our lungs, really important because the thinner something is, the more quickly things can diffuse through them or across them. So if you're trying to get oxygen from your lungs into your blood, the thinner that, that layer of epithelium is, the more quickly and more easily oxygen can diffuse into your blood and CO2 can diffuse the other way. Same with our blood vessels. So those are some examples of where we would find epithelial tissue within the animal body. Um, and we've looked at the different cells that make up the epithelial tissue and their arrangement. So you can see that structure equals function. Next, we have connective tissue. And this one's a little bit more complex than the epithelial tissue as it incorporates quite a few different types of tissue. They all serve the, a similar function in that they bind and support other tissues. 
So that's the, the main role of connective tissue. And unlike our epithelial tissue that is made up of cells that are tightly joined together, we see with connective tissue that it is made up of sparsely packed cells that are scattered through something called an extracellular matrix. So you've got fewer cells that are sort of loosely arranged, so they're scattered around, and in between those cells you have this sort of network of material um, that is referred to as the matrix. And that matrix will be made up of fibers, so protein fibers, and they will be within either a liquid, a jelly-like, or a solid foundation. So we've got these loosely packed cells surrounded by fibers, which make up our, our matrix alongside this liquid, jelly-like, or solid foundation. And there are three types of fiber that we find that make up the matrix that surrounds our cells. And they're all made of protein, as I mentioned just now. So we can have collagen fibers that provide strength and flexibility. We can have elastic fibers that stretch and snap back to their original um, shape and length. And then we also have reticular fibers that are used to join connective tissue to adjacent tissues. So we can actually see all three of these just by pinching the back of our hands. So if you gently pinch the back of your hand, what you'll see is that there's give there. You can actually sort of pinch it a bit, but not that much. So this is largely to do with the, the collagen fibers. So you've got strength there, but also flexibility, which is important because if you had if your skin was was rigid like a like the exoskeleton of an invertebrate well then you're not going to be able to move your hand in the same way that you can so we've got our collagen fibers there that that provide a, a little bit of give but not too much and then when you let go of the pinch the skin will snap back into its original position thanks to the elastic fibers and then obviously you, you you're not able to pull that skin up too much and that's because it's attached to the, to the underlying tissue, thanks to the reticular fibers. Um, the elastic fibers are quite interesting because over time, that will actually degrade. Um, and this is a, um, a, a, a big component of aging. So one of the reasons why we get wrinkly as we get older. And typically, our production and, and replacement of elastic fibers tends to drop off dramatically by the time you get into your late teens and early 20s. So by the time you get to your mid 20s, the replacement of this of these elastic fibers has almost come to a, a standstill. And that's why then once we start getting into our 30s, um, we start to see wrinkles appear. Um, and then by the time, you know, as we get older, we get into our, our 40s, 50s and 60s, we're just getting progressively wrinklier um, as, that, as the, are the elastic fibers that we have are actually degrading and, and not being replaced, um, which is a bit depressing, but there's certain things that, that we can do to protect the elastic fibers that we have. So we know that there are certain things that will degrade those fibers more quickly. So exposure to the sun or to UV light will degrade them quicker. So not so good news for those sun worshippers out there that like to sunbathe. The um, too much exposure to sun will actually degrade that. Uh, things like smoking, um, will also um, degrade those elastic fibers more quickly. Um, so you can sort of skip, get regular sleep and stay hydrated and stay out of direct sunlight and don't smoke, um, eat a healthy balanced diet. All of those types of things will, will actually help to um, protect and, and sort of make your elastic fibers last longer to fight off the, the development of wrinkles. So we've got those three types of fibers all made of protein, that make up the matrix that surrounds our cells. When it comes to the actual cells that make up our connective tissue then, there are quite a few different types, but I've got some examples here, um, the three of the main examples. So we've got the fibroblasts, and these secrete the, the protein that makes up those extracellular fibers that we just talk, uh, talked about. So fibro, fibroblasts actually produce those um, those fibers. Then we have osteoblasts and they secrete uh, the matrix that becomes mineralized to form bone. So when we look at bone we just see this hard substance 
But what we don't often realise that it is still based around the same structure of connective tissue. So we, we have cells, so osteoblasts. They secrete these fibres, these protein fibres, that will then become mineralised. So we, we depose calcium and magnesium um, that will actually then harden to become our bone. We also have things like macrophages. So macrophages that are involved in the immune system. Uh, so they are traveling around our bloodstream and our lymphatic system, engulfing foreign particles. Uh, so bacteria and virus particles and also cellular debris. So you can see down here a macrophage sort of lassoing some bacteria and then it'll bring them into the side of the cell where it will use hydrolytic enzymes to break them down. So we have our cells that secrete fibers and those fibers are what make up our matrix. And all told then we have six major types of connective tissue, but all based around the same structures. So we start off with loosely packed cells that secrete these fibers that make up this extracellular matrix. So the first type we have is loose connective tissue. So this binds epithelia to underlying tissues and also holds organs in place. We have cartilage, which is a strong and flexible support material. So you'll be familiar with probably with cartilage. It lines the end of our, our long bones. So it helps to provide um, lubrication or, or reduces friction would be a better way of saying it. It reduces friction at our joints. We also have um, fibrous connective tissue, so made up. Uh, this makes up our tendons, which attach muscles to our bones, and then also ligaments, which connect bones at joints. So this, these are quite tough types of tissue. We also have adipose tissue. So this is um, for storing fat for insulation and fuel. So we've talked about lipids before, and we've talked about the triglycerides, and how those triglycerides make up our adipose tissue. Well, adipose tissue is just another type of connective tissue. One that often surprises people when they're learning about tissue types for the first time is that blood is actually a, a type of connective tissue. As we know, it, it supports other tissues. It, it delivers everything from um, carbon dioxide and oxygen around the body to nutrients, amino acids and sugars and things like that. Uh, so it's a very, very important type of connective tissue and it's composed of blood cells. So again, we've got those loosely packed cells um, and then the matrix is a liquid like matrix, which is the blood plasma. And then our sixth type is our bone, which we mentioned just now. So based around those osteoblasts and bone is made up of those osteoblasts that secrete those protein filaments that then become mineralized to form our skeletons. Okay, so those are our six types of connective tissue. And again, here we can see our diagram of our wolf. And then we can see um, a, a close-up diagram of its uh, front leg. And then we can see those different types of tissue within this diagram. So we start at the, the top left-hand side here. We can see our uh, collagen fibers sort of coming down here. And we can see our fibrous connective tissue, making up the tendons, so attaching, so you can see the muscle here, and the muscle is attached to the bone via these tendons. We can see the cartilage up here, so the cartilage is lining the bones at the, at the joints to reduce friction. We have the adipose tissue here, making up the fat cells. We have the blood running through the blood vessels, and then we have the bone making up the bones of the skeleton you can see here so this is how you can see um, our whole range of the six types of connective tissue next we can look at the muscle tissue and you can see muscle tissue consists of long cells called muscle fibers and muscle fibers contract in response to nerve signals so muscles on their own don't really do a lot they need to be triggered by six signals from the nervous system and again this is something that we'll investigate in future sessions in vertebrates we find that muscle is found in three different types 
So we have skeletal muscle, which is often referred to as striated muscle, and this is responsible for voluntary movement. So this is the these are the muscles that are attached to our skeletons, essentially. So if you want to pick something up, or you want to walk or run or stand up or jump, all of the things that we do voluntarily, this is carried out by the skeletal or striated muscle. Next, we have the smooth muscle that is not voluntary. So we, we don't have any control over this. So we're looking at thing, um, smooth muscle being within the, the linings of our intestines and our stomach. Um, it's also within our blood vessels. So we have no control over this. This happens automatically. So a good example of this would be peristalsis, which is the process by which food moves down our esophagus. So when you eat food, you are in control or voluntarily swallowing that food. But once it passes down from your mouth into your esophagus, you, that you no longer have any control over it and you don't feel it moving down through your esophagus. But there are rhythmic waves of, of muscle contraction there that are moving the, the food downwards towards the stomach. Okay, so skeletal muscle is voluntary. Smooth muscle is involuntary. And the third type of muscle that we have is cardiac muscle. And with a name like that, you could probably guess where we find it. And it's in the heart. So our, our heart is basically just a, a big muscle. Um, and it's made up of, of involuntary cardiac muscle that controls the contractions of the heart. So skeletal muscle then is attached to bones by tendons. And it is responsible for voluntary movements. And it consists of bundles of long cells called muscle fibers. And each fiber made up of many repeating contractile units, and those contractile units are called sarcomeres. So sarcomeres consist of the proteins actin and myosin. So you can't quite make this out, but well, I've got a session on the muscular system, so we'll look at this in more detail. And it's quite an interesting process. So basically, every time that you see um, these lines, these vertical bands, which are the Z lines, you can see it here, the, the space between those two or two of those Z lines is, is a sarcomere, is one, re, one repeating contractile unit. And it's made up of two types of protein called actin and myosin that will actually overlap each other, which is what causes the muscle contractions. So it's actually each one of these sarcomeres that is shrinking, that is getting closer to each other, that causes the contraction over the whole muscle fiber. So it's a process called the sliding filament model. And it's something that we'll, we'll have a look at in a, um, in, a, in a future lesson, but it's pretty interesting the way it works. Next, we have the smooth muscle. So again, as I've said, find this in the walls of the, the digestive tract. So our intestines and our stomach and our esophagus, but we also find it within our bladder and our arteries and in quite a few other organs as well. And it's an involuntary muscle. So we're not in control of this. And it doesn't have the same striations that we see in skeletal muscle. So it contracts in a, in a different manner. And this is responsible for those involuntary activities. So churning of the stomach and the constriction of arteries. Next, we have the cardiac muscle. So it makes up the, the heart and it is striated. Um, the striations aren't quite as easy to see on this diagram. If you look at this part of the diagram, you can see them a little bit more clearly. Unlike skeletal muscle though, we get these thicker bands. So you can see them all through here. And these thicker vertical bands are called intercalated discs. And you can see here that they relay signals from cell to cell. So you almost get this kind of communication between the, the individual cardiac muscle fibers. And one of the reasons for that is, if you think about what the heart's doing, it's pumping blood around the body. So the contractions of the heart need to be synchronized. And it has lots of different things within it to, to enable the, the contractions to be synchronized that we'll talk about in, in the later lesson. But the, these intercalated discs enable that, or they, they certainly assist with that. Okay, so that is our muscle tissue. We have our striated or skeletal muscle, our smooth muscle, and our cardiac muscle. Our fourth type of tissue then is the nervous tissue. And nervous tissue 
senses stimuli and transmit signals throughout the animal. So that stimuli can be external, so it can be things like light or sound or touch, but it could also be internal stimuli, so a change in blood glucose levels or hormone levels or your temperature. So the, the nervous tissue is, is sensing um, stimuli or detecting stimuli both internally and externally. It's then transmitting that signal to typically to a central nervous system. So in us, that's our brain and our spinal cord. That then determines a outcome or a response to that stimulus and then we'll send out a response. And again, we'll look at this in more detail in a coming session. But nervous tissue contains two main types of cell. So we have our neurons. So these are our classic nerve cells. These are the ones that are transmitting our nerve impulses. And remember, this is just an introduction to animal tissues. We're going to look at neurons and how they transmit those nerve impulses through something called action potentials. We'll look at that in more detail in a later session. But neurons aren't the only type of cell that make up our, our nervous systems and our nervous tissue. They also have a whole support cast of glial cells, or just sometimes referred to as glia. And these are made up of things like Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes and um, astrocytes. And these help nourish, insulate and replenish neurons. So they help to feed them nutrients and oxygen whilst actually protecting them from infection and damage. Uh, so they, they play a vital role in, in supporting the nerve cells themselves. So neurons are the basic units of the nervous system then. They receive nerve impulses from other neurons and those feed into a part. So we can see here, we can see this is a neuron and up here you can see a part of this neuron called the cell body. And inside the cell body is where you're going to find all of your classic cell organelles. So your nucleus, your endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi body, all of those things that we've look, we looked at in this, the lesson on cell structure. But leading off of the cell body, you have these extensions called dendrites. And these will act as attachment points for other neurons. So they can sort of feed in and attach to the dendrites or they can attach to the cell body. So it provides a lot of surface area or attachment points for other, um, for other neurons. Neurons receive nerve impulses from other neurons via the cell body and dendrites. So you can imagine that the signal is coming in here and then what it does is right about here where the cell body starts to narrow into this long extension here. This long extension here is called the axon and the bit where the cell body leads into the axon is called the axon hillock. Good name. So what happens is an impulse will come into the dendrites or the cell body. And then that can trigger another nerve impulse that begins here at the axon hillock. And then it sends the impulse down the axon. So neurons only work in one direction. An impulse will come in here and then it will send another impulse down the axon. Okay, so they work as a, a one-way route, if you like. Impulses come in and then they transmit further impulses to other neurons via the axons. So axons we typically find are bundled together to form nerves. So when we're looking at a nerve, we're looking at a bundle of axons. And like I mentioned, they also have this supporting cast of glial cells or glia. And they are there to nourish, insulate and replenish neurons. So they surround the neurons to hold them in place. They will supply vital nutrients and oxygen. And then they also help to insulate one neuron from another. Because when we start to look at this in more detail, we'll see that the transmission of nerve impulses, so what we refer to as action potentials, well, what we're actually looking at is electrical charge. So it's important that you can insulate neurons from one another to prevent them interfering with one another. And then they also play a role in, in protecting the neurons. So they destroy pathogens and they'll actually help to break down and remove dead neurons as well. So they keep the whole system running healthily. 
So that brings us to the end of this this gentle, hopefully it was gentle anyway, introduction to animal tissues. So I think it's worth doing a quick recap as always. I'll go through these five questions, I'll read them out, then I'll give you a few minutes to answer them, and then we'll go through the answers together at the end. So question number one, what is the difference between anatomy and physiology? Number two, the wings of birds and bats show what type of evolution? Number three, what are the four types of animal tissue? Number four, what type of tissue is bone? And then number five, what are the 11 main organ systems in mammals? So I'll test your memory on that one. So I'll give you a few minutes to answer them and then we'll go through the answers together. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you've had a chance to answer all of those. So we'll just go through the answers now. So question number one, what is the difference between anatomy and physiology? Well, anatomy is the physical structure and physiology is the function of that organism or that particular part of the organism that we're looking at. So the example that I gave you earlier was the hand. So the anatomy would be the, the bones and the tendons and ligaments and muscles and blood vessels and nerves. That is the anatomy. And then the physiology will be the functions that the, the, the hand can actually do. So the gripping and grasping and squeezing and the fine movement, that would be the physiology. So structure and function. Number two, the wings of birds and bats show what type of evolution? Well, that's convergent evolution, or sometimes it's just called convergence. Number three, what are the four types of animal tissue? Well, they are epithelial, connective, muscular, and nervous. And number four, what type of tissue is bone? Well, it's a type of connective tissue. And then number five, what are the 11 main organ systems in mammals? Hopefully you had a go at this without looking at your notes, but I understand if you did, it's fine. So what are they? Well, we have the digestive, circulatory, respiratory, the lymphatic and, or immune system, uh, the excretory, endocrine, reproductive, nervous, integumentary, skeletal and muscular systems. So hopefully you did all right with those. But as always, if you didn't do too well on um, getting the answers right for now, um, go back over things a few times. And um, like I've said several times now, we're going to revisit a lot of this over the coming sessions where we look at specific organ systems. So you'll get a chance to pick up on more of that as we go through. So that brings us to the end of this session then. So hopefully now you would be able to describe the basic organization of animal bodies. So that is specialized cells come together to form tissues. Those tissues will come together to form organs. And then those organs will work together to make organ systems. And then you should be able to list the four main tissue types. So you can see them in the diagram there, connective, muscular, nervous, and epithelial. And then you should be able to briefly outline the structure and function of those four main types of tissue. Hopefully that was interesting and useful and I'll see you in the next session. Thanks very much.